Good morning. My name is Cindy Fan, Vice Provost for International Studies and Global Engagement and Professor of Geography at UCLA. It is my pleasure to welcome you to UCLA and to this conference. Um, this conference is called U.S.-Australian Dialogue on Cooperation in the Asia-Pacific. And in fact, this conference constitutes the third time that UCLA collaborates with the Australian government. And it has become a tradition to celebrate Good Day USA, and we are very pleased to continue this tradition into the future. Um, Chancellor Jean Block of UCLA and I had the pleasure of visiting Australia not too long ago, and we were very touched by the warm reception and hospitality uh, during our visit, and we, also, we were also very impressed by the caliber and vibrancy of the academic institutions in Australia that we visited. Um, today's conference is one of those situations and settings in which we can share ideas uh, through dialogue and maybe even debate, uh, build network, expand sort of our um, circles and build collaborations, and all of those things are extremely important in this age of international interdependence. And today's panel discussions will shed light on critical issues in the Asia Pacific region and also for the United States, including impacts of the US presidential election, um, tensions, tensions in the South China area, South China Sea in particular, which is in the news every day, very frequently, although maybe not as frequently as Donald Trump. <laughs> Issues such as um, global terrorism and the implications of the recently concluded Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. A truly impressive roster of panelists will share their knowledge and insight with you over the course of the day. But first, I have the distinct pleasure to welcome the Honorable Julia Bishop, Australian Minister for Foreign Affairs for, uh, to UCLA and to this conference. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Minister Julie Bishop a couple of years ago in her office in Canberra and learned about, among many things, the Colombo program, uh, a very innovative program by the Australian government to send students overseas to study. And we're truly honored to have her here today. And also we look forward to uh, working with her to strengthen relationship between Australia and the United States. And next I would like to introduce Ms. Chelsea Martin, Council General of Australia in Los Angeles. Ms. Martin is a career officer with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. She's an expert in public affairs and economic diplomacy. And Ms. Martin has served in various roles in the US over the past few years, including a political counselor, as political counselor to the Australian Permanent Mission to the UN and in the Australian Embassy in Washington, DC. She arrived in Los Angeles just two months ago, and she's already been at UCLA. She's already visited UCLA several times, which I'm very pleased with. And we, again, look forward to working with you and to expand our relations with this wonderful nation. Ms. Martin. Thank you, Cindy. I'm very pleased to welcome everyone to the first G'day USA West Coast policy event for 2016, and we're very happy to be partnering again with UCLA. Um, promoting dialogue on issues of shared uh, priority for Australia and the US is a key focus of G'day USA. Um, and this particular event, focusing on cooperation between us in the Asia Pacific, has become a feature of the LA program. It's a privilege for us to have uh, the Australian Minister for Foreign Affairs here today, the Honourable Julie Bishop. Um, and I would like to welcome her and Cal to the stage for an interview style discussion. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, Minister Bishop, it's a great honor to have you here. And we really appreciate you taking the time to share your thoughts with us and discuss some of the big issues. I know we're all uh, excited to have you. Let me start with a really big question, which is uh, the role of the United States in the Asia Pacific region. So the US has been a Pacific power for over a century. But Australia lives in the Asia Pacific, and you obviously see things in a different way than we do, or I shouldn't say obviously, you'll, you'll tell me whether you do, um, but I imagine you might see things in a different way. So how would you define and describe the role of the US in the region, and what, if anything, would you suggest we do differently? First, Carl, I want to thank UCLA for hosting this event today. It really is one of the um, 
most significant uh, aspects of our GIDA USA program. So thank you very much for doing this and I'm delighted to be here. As you say, the United States has long been a significant presence in the Asia Pacific. From our part of the world, we tend to describe the region as the Indo-Pacific, bound as we are by the two great oceans of the Indian and the Pacific. And so if I lapse between Asia Pacific and Indo Pacific, sure. you get what I mean, but we call it the Indo Pacific. But the United States has provided the security guarantee for the region, certainly since the Second World War. It's had um, an enormous and powerful military presence there that has advantaged the nations of the region. They have been able to grow economically with that security guarantee provided by the United States. And without doubt, the majority of the countries in the region and the leadership to whom I speak want to see more US presence, more US leadership, not less. And we most certainly welcome the Obama administration's policies about the pivot or rebalance to Asia. And uh, most other countries in the region certainly welcome that as well. The geostrategic and economic heft in the world is shifting from west to east. That's already underway. Our region will be one of the most important and most dominant in shaping world affairs in years to come. And both the United States and Australia recognises that peace and stability and prosperity in our region will reflect our peace and stability and prosperity. So it is a vital area and I certainly welcome uh, the US's focus on our region. In terms of what more the US can do, there are a number of um, initiatives underway which are very, very helpful. Um, and as the US's closest, I would say, ally in the region, um, we say this with our interests and your interests at heart. We need to see the Trans-Pacific Partnership ratified. Uh, that is seen very much as the economic manifestation of the rebalance. If that were to fail, it would have an impact on the perception of the rebalance more generally. The United States can also play a very important role in the regional organisations, uh, the ASEAN countries, the 10 countries that, that make up Southeast Asia, are a very important component of the peace and stability in the region and the more the US engages with the ASEAN as a group or sure. with the individual countries, uh, the better it will be for us all. Uh, one example, the United States has recently become much closer to Vietnam and engaged much more closely with Vietnam. I can't encourage you enough to continue to do that, to bring Vietnam into our sphere. And uh, they are... Um, they are ready to be much more deeply engaged with the United States. You're doing it militarily. We're doing it in a trade sense. In fact, Vietnam is our fastest growing ASEAN trading partner. So there are great opportunities for us to more deeply engage. Also, the United States can engage more deeply in trilateral uh, discussions and uh, US, Japan and Australia. We have a regular trilateral. I would include India in mm -hmm. some of these um, permutations. And then finally, the US defence force posture. Australia is a beneficiary of that. We have um, about 1,600 Marines at present in Darwin um, to the north. Uh, we need to be very transparent and communicate the reason for that um, presence in Darwin, as I believe we have been with our friends and neighbours, and promote it as a positive that having a significant contingent of um, US military in Darwin can be seen as a very good thing. Let's face it, um, the military are often the first responders to humanitarian and natural disasters, and our region um, is one of the most natural disaster prone in the world. And having uh, a military with the capability of the United States positioned around the Asia Pacific gives us a level of comfort and also to other countries in the region. You mentioned TPP and I want to come back to that, but just to follow up, you said most countries in the region 
welcome to greater presence. But as we know, not everyone does. And so one country that's maybe less comfortable is China. And well, I, just I wanna, actually had North Korea in mind. Well, that's another one. <laughs> well, we'll come back to that as well. But let me ask you about China. So I know that you met with Vice President Biden yes. this week. And at least according to the readout, one of the things that you discussed was the importance of a rules-based order in the region. And so what role do you see, what's the appropriate role for China in developing that rules-based order? China is, in my view, seeking to find a place for itself um, as a global power. And it's coming to terms with the responsibilities that attach to being a regional and global mm -hmm. power. It's trying to find a space given its economic importance. And let's face it, about 120 countries around the world consider China to be their number one two-way trading partner. So what happens in China matters to most of the globe in an economic sense. Um, and we've seen China find that space in um, the Asian Investment Infrastructure Bank, you know, setting up their own um, institutions where there might be a vacuum. And I'll come back to that point sure. in relation to the TPP. Uh, and so we've joined the AIIB uh, when it um, met the standards that we thought were appropriate for an institution of that type. And this is where the United States and other nations have such a role to play. Um, China needs to be reminded of the requirements of the international system and what an international rules-based order that has served us pretty well, not perfectly, but served us pretty well. Yeah. This is not the time. Can I talk to you later? Millions of animals on your live Can I ask you? I'll be able to speak to you later. No, we've come and tried to speak to Chelsea Martin, and she won't speak. No, I didn't so say Chelsea Martin. Would you like well, to speak you know, to me I later? Thank like you. Thank you. I'd like to speak to you later. On me. You have mm -hmm. a barbaric live export trade that has been going on, as you know, for decades. You send millions of animals in death ships to foreign countries. So I'm going to have to ask you to and in Asia, sit down. Thousands and hundreds and thousands of Australian citizens are against this barbaric trade. Americans are against would it. Would you like the me to answer this? Against it. In a moment. Oh, the thank veterinarians you. in the world are against it. Your ships arrive on foreign shores with tens of thousands of dead animals that have suffered without ventilation, water, or heat. I think They're we've dying all by the tens of thousands and showing up in foreign ports with dead corpses on your death ships. When they reach the Middle East, they are hammered in the head with mallets, electrocuted in the eyes with electric uh, prods, and they are murdered for ritual sacrifice. These, these we've heard atrocities enough. have been documented by the media Let it go. for decades, and Australia yeah. turns a blind okay. eye. Barnaby Joyce is in bed with whomever, the cattle ranchers. Animals are individual sentient beings that do not deserve this barbaric treatment. You have been implored for decades to stop this barbaric treatment, and all you continue to do is expand it and expand it and expand it. We are here to speak out against this barbaric deal that Barnaby Joyce has recently made with China. The world is against live export and we are demanding a ban to live export. We will not go away and we are not going to allow this to continue. You Thank really you. need to evaluate as, I went to high school in Australia, it's my second home, and I don't want to see Australia doing this barbaric practice anymore. It's, it's horrible. You should care about animals and stop this barbaric practice. Thank you. My apologies, Minister. Um, and so what we are seeking to do is embrace China as part of the international system. Now what's happened in the South China Sea uh, goes against that because um, China has not been as conscious of the sensitivities as we had hoped and escalations in the region have certainly increased, uh, tensions have certainly escalated in the region. Um, we have not taken a stand we don't have a view on the 
different territorial claims, and I think that's the same as the United States. In South States. China Sea? In the South China Sea. We believe that the parties should negotiate their different claims. Uh, we respect the right of parties to take the differing claims to arbitration, as the Philippines have done, and there is a, an arbitration of the ICJ that will probably reach a conclusion in the next few months. And I think that that will reinforce or state again the principles uh, that apply to the law of the sea and uh, the inherent right of countries to freedom of navigation, freedom of overflight in international waters and define again whether an artificial reef built over a low-lying coral reef uh, is able to create any particular territorial rights. So this case is, I think, very important. Australia sought to be an observer, as did um, Japan and Singapore and others. And I think that that will be the game changer. Uh, China rejects the jurisdiction of the ICJ. But this is where uh, we say to China, publicly and privately, that they are not painting themselves in a positive light if they reject the findings of the ICJ, which after all, is uh, part of this international rules-based order that we must adhere and adhere to and uphold. Thank you. I do want to ask about TPP, but since you mentioned um, the Asia, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, can I just quickly ask, do you think it was a mistake for the United States to not be more supportive? I would never suggest that the United States <laughs> has made a mistake in foreign or domestic policy. Uh, we took a position that if we were able to negotiate greater transparency, greater accountability, um, more acceptable rules of governance, and we were joined by like-minded countries, some of the European countries and others, then there was a purpose to be served by the AIIB. There's a huge dearth of in infrastructure funding and infrastructure investment globally, but also in our region. And if this institution was going to provide an opportunity for um, that kind of infrastructure build, particularly in parts of the Asia Pacific that are still desperately underdeveloped, then it was something that we should be part of to shape it. Now, it's a little bit like the TPP. Mm -hmm. You've got to be in it to help shape the rules. So we took the view that as long as the thresholds met what we would consider to be an acceptable investment for the Australian government for an institution like this, then we should be on the inside trying to shape the composition, the nature, the standards, the rules, the governance. And so that's what we Sensible. decided to do. Thank you. So you mentioned TPP. I know Australia is very supportive. Why is TPP so significant? What are the stakes? Australia and the United States are both um, open free market economies. Uh, we, in particular, depend f for our standard of living and prosperity on being able to trade with the rest of the world. And um, we are an export-oriented country. So we believe that the TPP should set the gold standard for our region for trade and investment rules. And it brings together 12 countries and provides a much more seamless an open um, system for the 12 countries. This should encourage others to come on board. Already South Korea has given an indication that they would like to join. And Vice President Biden assures me that China is interested. And uh, if it's a success, as I hope it will be, then if China came on board, that really is getting some significant economies together. Already it represents about 36 to 40 percent of global GDP. Uh, so the TPP is our opportunity to set the standard for the rules that we want to apply um, for trade and investment, trade liberalisation in our region. And I did urge um, my friends in Washington, um, on the Hill, in the White House, to ratify the TPP. For if it doesn't go ahead, it will leave a vacuum, and that vacuum will be filled. There is already another um, regional trade agreement underway, RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership between ASEAN, China, Australia's in it as well. It hasn't um, progressed as quickly as the TPP, 
but it's there. If and when the TPP is ratified, then I think China will ramp up RCEP, the ASEANs will ramp up RCEP, and maybe in you know, my, um, my holy grail could be reached, and that is what APEC was set up to do and create an Asia-Pacific free trade zone. And that would be driven by the United States and it would be a great credit to the US to show the leadership we expect of you in the economic field as well. Is it Australia's position that China should be welcomed into TPP? If China is prepared to meet the standards and the rules and the, uh, the bars that we've set, we should embrace it. Absolutely. Uh, that's why the TPP is so important. The potential for it to become the norm, and it, it, it really is an outstanding um, free trade agreement. Not everybody got what they wanted, and I know that there are going to be some people who are um, very concerned about it, about free trade agreements, but I think that there are enormous opportunities for economic growth and importantly for jobs in the countries that are a party to it. Um, Vice President Biden was heading to Baltimore, or he might be there now, but the day after I met him, and he said that he thought the TPP would be raised um, quite vocally in Baltimore. So I don't underestimate the challenges that um, the United States Congress and administration will have with this, but from Australia's perspective, we believe that it is worth it, that ratifying the TPP, getting it through Congress will bring untold benefits, um, as many strategic benefits as economic. Can you say a word about those strategic benefits? What do you see? The United States and its friends taking a leadership role in setting what should be the international norm in trade agreements. I mean, that's a, that's a very powerful, in the face of uh, what happened with Doha or what didn't happen with Doha, <coughs> um, I think the United States taking a lead and exerting its um, undoubted economic power as, a, as an economic leader uh, must be good for our region, good for the world. The United States, notwithstanding the challenges um, that you have faced, notwithstanding what's happening to the markets at present, remains uh, the most significant and important economy in the world. And I would like to see it continue. We would too. Mr. Bishop, animals are not property. Animals right. are not objects. Just let it go. Just let it go. Animals are not things. They're not things for us to buy and sell, exploit and kill, eat and wear. They're feeling unique individuals just like us. And when we gather here today to talk about commerce, and commerce involves the sale of the bodies and excretions of tortured individuals who are violently killed, who are confined for their entire lives and made to suffer. And you're wasting your opportunity. She said she would talk to you. Sorry. It's not right. Their voices need to be heard. You don't actually want to talk to me, do you? Because I've offered to meet with you. But they don't want to suffer and die, and they cannot come here to advocate for themselves. You're wasting enough. For a moment, imagine if all of you were the animals being sold and killed and brutalized on these death ships, on these things we call farms, in slaughterhouses. It's wrong, and their voices need to be heard. It's not commerce. It's injustice. Thank you very much. I want to turn back to the South China Sea. Mm -hmm. So a difficult situation, as you mentioned, there's a legal approach, and that legal approach is very important. There's also been a military approach, and the military approach has been, as you well know, the United States recently sent the USS Lassen on a freedom of navigation uh, maneuver. There was actually some question about whether it exactly how to characterize it. Uh, but using our military as a way to emphasize the importance of freedom of seas in that region. What else can the other parties in the region do, and specifically what can Australia do, or what is Australia doing um, to support a peaceful resolution of the tensions around South China Sea? We have to be careful with the terminology. Yes. What we, what we support is um, freedom of navigation, freedom of overflight uh, in international waters, international skies. Now, um, as I understand international law, uh, building an artificial structure over a low-lying reef does not give rise to territorial claims. Does not. So, um, and that's one of the issues that the Philippines arbitration will be 
um, considering. So we respect the right of all nations to undertake um, and traverse journeys through the South China Sea. 60% um, of Australia's trade passes through the South China Sea. We have an interest in ensuring that there is freedom of navigation, freedom of overflight. Um, you might recall some time ago, December 2013, when China unilaterally, unilaterally declared an air defence identification zone over the Senkaku Daiyu Islands, and the United States pretty well sent a B-52 to have a little look at it. That's right. Went through. And I think that sent a message. That's um, how the US viewed it. Um, we supported that. And I think that that's important, that we continue to uphold what we see as international law. Um, the ASEAN countries have been talking for quite some time about a code of conduct. And it's not easy for 10 countries um, who are in different spheres of influence to come together to agree one position on something as sensitive as the South China Sea. But they are making progress. And I think the Philippines arbitration may well give them the uh, international law platform that they need to require China to agree sure. to a code of conduct for behaviour in the South China Sea. And I do put some store by that. Others say, hey, they've been talking about this for a long time, but I think that the Philippines arbitration might give it more uh, momentum. Do you think it's helpful to have, alongside the legal strategy, a more robust military strategy? Well, interestingly, President Xi said while he was in the United States that they did not intend to militarise the islands. I would hold him to that statement okay. time and time again. I've raised it every time I've spoken on the topic that President Xi said they did not intend to militarise. Uh, we've asked for an end to the reclamation. We've um, requested China stop the construction work. Uh, China has said that the structures can be used for public goods. Um, for example, building lighthouses, harbours for ships that are carrying out humanitarian work. I did say to Foreign Minister Wang Yi, this is great. When can Australia start using the harbours? He said, I'll get back to you. <laughs> so I think we should take China at its word and start, uh, um, if, if these structures are there and they're public goods, well, let's test that. That's a great strategy. We started off with a mention of North Korea. So let's return to that. Uh, what can the, the West and the rest of Asia do? Australia has long supported, along with the United States, of the people of South Korea. And it's quite salutary to remember that the two Koreas are technically still at war, mm -hmm. even though the war was between 1950 and 1953. Uh, it's never been formally resolved. What deeply concerns me in all of this is the plight of uh, millions of North Koreans. And there have been some independent and pretty objective reporting done on the quality of life for North Koreans, including one by former Justice of our High Court, Michael Kirby, which he presented to the United Nations. As a result of that report, which referred to systemic human rights abuses and appalling um, incidents of the treatment of millions of people in North Korea. Australia, as then a temporary member of the Security Council, was able to get the issue of human rights abuses in North Korea as a permanent agenda item on the Security Council's program. First time, first time ever that this has happened. I mean, North Korea and its nuclear program has always been there, but the treatment of the people of North Korea. And why this is relevant is because it brings into play what China's going to do about this. China has a diabolical dilemma on its hands. Um, they are considered to be North Korea's only friend, but they're as frustrated with North Korea as the rest of the world. And we are looking to impose greater sanctions on North Korea, economic sanctions, and there's a resolution before the Security Council that Samantha Power, your UN representative, is negotiating. What does China do? Does it impose greater sanctions on North Korea that may well have the inevitable consequence that millions of North Koreans will seek to leave? Um, do they impose sanctions that will have an impact on their companies that are the only ones essentially trading with North Korea? 
it's an interesting and difficult position for China. Without question, a North Korea with nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles is not only a threat to the region, it's an international security threat. And uh, it will come down to some kind of negotiation with the United States, Japan, South Korea and others, China, Russia, uh, to contain this. But if China turns against North Korea, Kim Jong-un will say, even China is against us. Of course we've got to have nuclear weapons to protect ourselves. The entire world's against us. So it's a, a very challenging situation and it's one that I have discussed endlessly with um, leaders around the world and I don't know that there's any answer um, at this stage. In the past, under Kim Jong-il, there used to be a, a kind of predictability to the provocations. Now there's no predictability. Uh, Kim Jong-il used to give notice of the fact that he was about to carry out a nuclear test and then you'd it'd follow up with a demand that the United States do this or do that. We've had none of that. There was no notice of this recent test that they claim to be a thermonuclear, although that's uh, not likely. There's been no demand in following it up and that is eerily disturbing. Keep your questions short and uh, to the point, of course. Brian Humphreys from Northrop Grumman. So I'll keep my question short. You, you, Minister, you began your, your uh, sort of discussion this morning by mentioning the 1,600-odd Marines in, the, in Darwin. I wonder if you could talk now about if we're in the 65th year of the ANSYS Alliance and what do you think the next sort of five to ten years holds in terms of Australian and United States military Ours is the most remarkable alliance. Uh, whilst our strategic alliance is 65 years in the making, our diplomatic relations go back 75 years. And as we often point out to audiences uh, such as this, Australia has stood with the United States in every single major military conflict that the United States has been involved with in the 20th century and the 21st. So we are the closest of um, military friends and partners, as well as you know, strategic, economic, cultural, you name it. Um, it's a most extraordinary relationship. Um, I hope that we see an enhancement of the um, defence posture in the Asia Pacific. Uh, I see it as um, for the good of the region and most, certain, most certainly Australia supports that. We also support what the United States is doing with other nations. I mentioned Vietnam, but also Japan. We welcome Japan's more normalised defence posture, and we think that Japan can be a force for good around the world, that, that just in terms of what it does in peacekeeping and humanitarian... Can everybody hear? Peacekeeping and humanitarian work is, uh, is um, to be embraced. So I think that we'll see more uh, joint exercises, not just with Australia and the United States. We, our militaries know each other very well and we can work together in virtually any circumstances, anywhere, but embracing others. Um, in fact, we've now had some initial China, US, Australia exercises. I think that we can continue to enhance and enlarge those undertakings. Uh, what we're doing with India, as and India is a significant you know, element in all of this. The more the US can engage with India, the better it will be. So I think as partners, we can use our, our um, joint understanding and engagement to bring others uh, into the fold. Can I ask a question, ma'am? Um, sorry, sorry, hold on one second. Time for two more questions, and they're right here and here. Thank okay, you so much. Thank you. No, she said she would discuss it with them afterward. That's okay, so you don't want to address the live animal like She does, just, just not in this forum. This is not the forum. This is a foreign policy forum, and I yeah, think she's clearly offered to discuss it later. And it's about foreign policy, and that's about trade. I mean, people are genuinely concerned about this, and I just want to ask a very simple question. Well, you have other questions before you. That's correct. It's just a matter of being polite. All right. Your point has been made. It's a good one. It's a serious one. Now we have the opportunity for a couple of questions, and we're going to do that. All right. All right. Uh, okay, thank you. Good morning, Minister. Good My morning. name is Madeleine Miller. I'm a student here at UCLA and from Australia. 
I understand that innovation is very important to the Australian government right now, and you in particular, and I would love to know more as an Australian working in a creative and innovative space, how Australia is working with the US in innovation. The GIDA USA program is an economic and cultural diplomacy initiative, uh, and over the years it's focused on um, various aspects of our um, trade and investment relationship. Uh, under Prime Minister Turnbull, we have embraced innovation at the heart of our um, economic policies and in December he published our National Science and Innovation Agenda and part of that is to ensure that Australia be, is able to create the environment that encourages start-ups and crowdsourcing and new forms of funding and really taps into the innovative creativity that is so inherent in the Australian people. Um, we've always been enterprising and ingenious in um, coming up with clever ideas. We haven't always been able to implement them and we haven't always been able to benefit from them um, economically. So this innovation agenda is our opportunity to not replicate Silicon Valley. Nobody can replicate Silicon Valley as far as I'm concerned. But We're we trying here in LA. Yeah. <laughs> well, we can't replicate uh, what's happening in the United States in various pockets of innovation around this this great country, but we can certainly uh, take elements of it, adapt it to what's happening in Australia, and encourage more people to take their ideas in every sphere, whether it's in defence, whether it's in education, whether it's in um, advanced manufacturing, whatever it is, and be much more um, embracing of change. And we're trying to do it in the government, in my own department, the foreign aid budget, uh, we have, it's a $4 billion a year budget that's focused on improving quality of life and defeating poverty in our region, in, in South West Pacific in particular. And we have set up an innovation hub, we call the Innovation Exchange. We've brought people in from the private sector, uh, we've got somebody from a USA, from the World Bank, from um, a whole range of different areas. And they're in there, like a, you know innovation lab, coming up with new and creative ways of delivering aid um, to solve seemingly intractable aid problems. It means taking risks. It means acknowledging failure. That's not what governments do. So it's a complete change of attitude uh, within this hub. And we're hoping that that will um, be taken up by all our departments. It will be an attitude, a culture of government, and thus harnessing the um, great entrepreneurial spirit of the private sector, more partnerships with the private sector, working with, not against the private sector. As Prime Minister Turnbull says, it's a very exciting time to be an Australian. We have time for one more. Uh, Larry Gerald, local investment advisor. My question is about uh, China's relationship with the TPP, uh, or maybe China's response to Silk Road Initiative, or it's also called One Belt, One Road. I wonder how seriously you take that and what effect you think it would have on the Asian Pacific uh, trend. Oh, I, I take China's economic aspirations very seriously. Uh, they have a very deliberate policy uh, of expanding their economic influence throughout the region. Um, they uh, are um, undertaking a whole range of initiatives. Um, I, I just mentioned the AIRB, but there's a whole range of initiatives uh, to enhance its, um, its influence. Uh, that's why the TPP is so important, um, because the 12 nations that make up the TPP, as I said, make up nearly 40% of global GDP. It's a significant trade agreement. It will be um, a game changer in terms of setting the rules. Uh, I would think that um, there is a possibility that China might seek to join the TPP at some point if it's a success, obviously. Um, if it's not a success, or if we don't get it ratified, well, then I expect China will have its own um, group of countries, the 10 ASEANs, and they are some significant economies. I mean, just take Indonesia. Indonesia, uh, within the next 10, 20 years, is gonna be in the top 10 economies in the world. Um, you know, 245 million people, um, moderate Muslim community, um, it's going to be one of the largest economies on earth. And 
they would be in the heart of the RCEP trade grouping. So we're pretty keen to see, the, very keen to see the TPP get off the ground to be a success, to set the standard, to bring in other countries and hopefully bring China into our sphere, our trading system. Minister Bishop, thank you so much for sitting down and talking. With us.